Summertime is the prime time for the pursuit of pleasure. We all experience pleasure, of course, in different ways, and that has researchers trying to figure out just what causes us to feel pleasure in the first place. Our cover story this morning is reported by Susan Spencer of 48 Hours. It can be as simple as a sunset. The glow of sunset in the summer sky. As decadent as a dessert. The gleam of love light. Or as extravagant as a weekend in Paris. These are the things I love. But we all have our own little pleasures. Chocolate and peanuts. Mmm. Oh, I love Mexican food. I'm a Barbie collector. I have like over a hundred Barbies. The rush of cliff jumping when you're up in the air and you're like hoping the water is deep enough and your heart is like beating a thousand miles an hour and you splash. <laughs> Pleasure is an instantaneous feeling of something good. Professor Gregory Burns, a neuroeconomist at Emory University, notes that some pleasures are no less than a matter of survival. You know, when you teach a bunch of undergraduates and teenagers like I do, and I ask them to list the things that give them pleasure, sleep is always at the top of the list. What else is predictably on that list? Well, so you have kind of the basic needs, right? So you have food, sleep, and sex. Pretty much boils down to that if you're talking about <laughs> actual pleasure. But pleasure goes well beyond basic needs. Yale psychologist Paul Bloom says why we enjoy what we enjoy is very complicated. It seems like we, we just taste food, we taste wine, we, we, we respond to our visceral sensations, but actually it is surprisingly deep. So deep, in fact, that Bloom was pleased to write a book on pleasure, which he says is as much about our brains as about our experiences. Our pleasure is a response not just to the physical makeup of something, what it looks like or tastes like or smells like or feels like, but rather to our beliefs about what it really is, what its real essence is. And boy, can we be fooled. Paul Bloom recalled one experiment with wine drinkers done by scientists at Stanford and Caltech. Half the people are told they're drinking cheap plunk. The other half are told they're drinking something out of a $100 or $150 bottle. It tastes better to them if they think they're drinking from an expensive bottle. And it turns out that, that if they think they're drinking expensive wine, parts of the brain that are associated with pleasure and reward light up like a Christmas tree. So if I have people over for dinner, I should add a little one in front of the price tag and put it on the table. That is the ultimate trick to making wine taste better. And it's the sort of trick that works only on human beings. Both my dog and me enjoy drinking water when we're thirsty, but I'm the one who cares about where the water came from whether it's bottled water or from the tap, um, my dog doesn't care. You're the one that if we put a higher price tag on that bottle of water, you'll enjoy it more. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I, might, I might give my dog premium dog food, but the dog doesn't care that I spent a lot of money for it. Here we go, $75,000, $80,000, say $100,000 to you, sir. One People, on the other hand, seem to get enormous pleasure out of spending enormous sums on some very curious things. $32,500 on the right side. <laughs> Was Michael Jackson's jacket really worth $1.8 million? At $42,500. Or how about President Kennedy's tape measure, Salt. which went for almost $50,000 at auction? Or Eric Clapton's guitar, snapped up for just under a million bucks? Given all that, Paul Bloom wondered what people might pay for the pleasure of owning, say, George Clooney's sweater? The answer is a fair amount. Much more than they'd pay for my sweater or for a brand new sweater. But why? For bragging rights or to resell on eBay? Apparently not. So we did an experiment where we tell people, you can't boast about it, you can't resell it, and the value goes down a little bit. But here's what makes the value really drop. We told another group of subjects that we thoroughly washed it before it got to them. Now the value plummets. Is not still George Clooney's sweater? As my wife put it, you've washed away the Clooney cooties. <laughs> you've, you've washed away the sort of essence of the person. That gives them more it. pleasure it does. in owning it. It does. Human beings are strange. Human beings are extraordinary. 
Some pleasures are universal, like eating these mouth-watering butter and sugar concoctions here at Magnolia Bakery in New York City. This really is sheer pleasure on a plate. But not all of life's pleasures are so straightforward. In fact, if you think about it, some of them are downright weird. Cheese. Cheese is spoiled milk. It smells bad. But the point is that we get great pleasure out of it, and some people love the stinky cheeses. And part of the pleasure of eating them is that they really smell bad, but they're good. Psychologist Paul Rosen's studies go well beyond the pleasures of the disgusting to the joy of the downright painful. Take hot chili peppers. Well, hot chili peppers are eaten by over two billion people in the world, and yet this is an innately negative experience. Little babies don't like it. So the question to me was, why would anybody put in their mouth something that produces a pain signal from the mouth to the brain? His answer, what he calls benign masochism. The same human quirk that explains why we enjoy horror movies that terrify us. Why we like sad songs that make us cry. It's a sense of your mind over your body. Your body is saying, bad news, get out of here. Your mind knows, I'm actually not in danger. I'm mastering this negative experience, and my mastery of it gives me pleasure. But there are limits. Just ask those chili pepper people. What happens is the one that people like best tends to be the one that's just below the level they can't bear. In other words, they're pushing the limit of how hot they can stand it. Similarly with roller coasters, people who love roller coasters will like the steepest and scariest one they can stand. Push your pleasure to that limit, and odd as it seems, odds are you'll want more. So what's the best strategy to maximize life's pleasures? When something pleasurable happens, this lights up. Well, this can light up for a couple of different reasons. So Emory professor Gregory Burns did an experiment up. that offers a clue. When he gave subjects alternating drops of water and juice, their brain activity showed they preferred the juice. No surprise. But when the juice came at unexpected intervals and was a surprise, they liked it even more. His advice then? Surprise yourself. You have to take risks, I think, to really experience pleasure. There's a reason why people say the first time is always the best. You know, the first time you experience something, whether it's the first kiss, your first bite of sushi, whatever you like, it's always the best. When it's really a surprise. Yep. So whether it's Clooney's sweater, roller coasters, chili peppers, or something else entirely. Oh god, chocolate is terrific, you know. Cupcakes, perhaps, or sweets. Good friends, good beer, and like, uh, summertime, without a doubt. Treasure those pleasures, but remember, there's always room for something new. So people should just keep pushing the envelope. I think so. I mean, I try. I'm going bungee jumping tomorrow, that kind of thing. Yeah, why not? <laughs>